this event is specifically about um, scientists and clinicians using Twitter and the effective ways to do that. Um, and I'm really thrilled that you're all here and that we have a great turnout. And so hopefully we can get more active Twitter users. And if you're already on Twitter, then um, our panelists will be ready for tips um, to, so that you can use Twitter in different ways. Uh, my name's Julie Kiefer, and I'm here with Libby Mitchell. Libby, raise your hand. And we're with um, University of Utah Health Marketing and Communications. And we're thrilled to be um, accompanied by our panelists. Um, closest to me is D John Ryan. We have Molly Cummins, Kristen Kwan, Brian Jones, and our own very own Libby. And um, <coughs> so Twitter is definitely growing in popularity amongst uh, scientists and clinicians. There are 330 million active Twitter users in total each month, and a recent PLOS One article showed that hundreds and thousands of those are scientists and, and physicians. And you know what we do know is that Twitter is a very easy and um, quick tool for um, getting your reputation out there, getting your expertise out there. Um, you can use it to promote your research. You can use it to crowdsource information. So maybe that's um, breaking news in, in your particular field, or maybe it's asking a question for so that the wisdom of uh, the Twitter sphere can answer it. Um, and also, it's a fabulous tool for connecting beyond your normal networks. And um, so these are things we all hope to cover, um, plus your questions as well. Um, I do want to get a sense of who you are. Um, and so if with a show of hands, can you tell me who is not on Twitter or who maybe has an account that they rarely use? Anyone? A couple. OK, awesome. And then who here uses Twitter sometimes or very often? So there's, there's a good representation of both. That's great. Um, and then we want to know who you are. Um, who amongst you are, are people who do science and research? And you can be students, trainees, postdocs, fellows, faculty, any staff, any of those. OK, good chunk. And then you may raise your hand more than once. Um, who, it, who are healthcare providers that interact with patients? A couple? OK. Um, and then finally, um, and, but not least, uh, communicators, administrators, and anything else I haven't mentioned. OK, awesome. Fantastic. Um, so I think um, you know, the, kind of the point of this, um, this event is to learn from our panelists' experiences. So we're going to focus mostly on that and kind of less on the nuts and bolts of Twitter. But we're happy to answer those questions as well. So please ask them if you have them. And know that um, Libby Mitchell is always available. Um, to, to coach you one on one, or she can come to departmental meetings or group meetings or whatever works best for you. She is here to, to help get people active on Twitter. Um, so let's start with Libby. Um, Libby, can you give us sort of the baseline? You know, what is Twitter and what are some of the advantages over other types of social media? Can you hear me? Is that good? Uh, so Twitter is what's known as a microblogging site. Uh, it used to be 140 characters per. Uh, tweet. It's now 280 characters per tweet. Um, the nice thing about Twitter is that it is it requires the least amount of personal information. Basically, you just have to have a username, uh, an email, or a phone number to retrieve your password and a password. Um, you can put as little or as much information about yourself on it as, pos as you want. Um, you'll notice that a lot of doctors and clinicians will put very, very little information about themselves and then just put a link to their, to their bio page on the, their official website so that people know that they know what they're talking about. Uh, the nice thing about Twitter is that it is extremely searchable and it's extremely um, egalitarian in how it works. Uh, other sites like Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, their main goal is to get you to pay to have people see your content. For instance, on our Facebook page, we have over 36,000 followers. A good post that I don't have to put any money behind that is, I consider viral is seen by maybe 5% of those followers. Whereas on Twitter, you can have a post go out and you may have only 120 followers. But if you're putting out good information that the people want and the people want to share, it can be seen by thousands of people. 
um, especially if you're tagging people the right way, if you're reaching out to them, if you're using the right hashtag, if you're hijacking hashtags at the right time. Um, it can be seen by an, an infinite audience. I always like to tell people that Twitter is not a numbers game, it's a code break. It's about putting out the information that you want as many times as you can to get it to as many people as possible. The other nice thing about Twitter is that there is no such thing as overkill. No one is ever going to go to your Twitter page and look down your, your page. And if they do, they really need to get a hobby. <laughs> um, but you can put out, for instance, from the University of Utah Health uh, account, I will put out the exact same article five to ten times a day, just with different headlines, to see how many people are going to see it. You know, because it might be that a mom who, who's worried about kids' sleep is going to search for something different than somebody who's worried about you know, getting enough sleep as a college student or a medical, but it's the exact same article. Um, the other nice thing about Twitter is that you really can, you can contact anybody. I mean, uh, how, how many people are aware of the musical Hamilton? <laughs> so Lin-Manuel Miranda is on Twitter. He has over two million followers. Um, I put up a picture of my kid in, she was, it, it was character day. And I, she dressed as Lin-Manuel Miranda, because she was made to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I put the picture on Twitter. I tagged Lin-Manuel Miranda. I didn't think anything of it. And then about three hours later, he retweeted it with the words, nailed it. <laughs> and, and everything exploded. But things like that can happen. I use an example um, of Molly's from 2013 during the, um, was it? It wasn't called the sequester. It was called when the government oh. shut down. It was the sequester. Yes. No, it was called the sequester. Uh, and she was in, uh, who, was, who was the conversation with? Francis Collins. Francis Collins of the NIH. Now, that's somebody that Molly probably wouldn't be in a room in, but she was getting responses from. So we can't prove that she got her grant money because of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I may infer it in my presentation. <laughs> But the nice thing about Twitter is that it really does level the playing field. It makes it so an article that you may put in a journal that may be seen by a couple dozen people all of a sudden has an audience of 330 million possibly. So that's, that's my elevator pitch. I could talk forever. So we'll, we'll go on from there. Awesome. Um, so maybe we'll have each of the panelists um, just simply explain, you know, what, what do you personally like about Twitter? What do you get out of it? Why do you use it? Um, start with uh, John Ryan. Uh, so I'm John Ryan. I'm a cardiologist. And uh, so I've done a couple of different things over the years. So I kind of started getting into this um, about 10 years ago. I started a social media uh, platform for New England Journal of Medicine. It was called, and uh, it was called eCommunities. You never heard of it because none of you signed on. Um, <laughs> and that didn't go very well. And then, um, then a few years later, they came back to me. I don't know why. And they asked me to set up another one, and it was called Cardio Exchange. And that one actually did go well, and uh, we ended up getting a lot of traction in terms of cardiology. Um, and that, the reason that I was approached to do that was because people had gotten to think that I was comfortable with social media and good at social media. Um, and then ultimately, that's kind of transformed into doing the social media for the American Heart Association journals. Uh, so the reason that I got involved in it was because of the helping to promote science. So I was getting a little bitter and twisted that people would you know, talk about science without actually a lot of inside information um, or a lot of insight. And they criticize science or people would come out and, and we've all seen this, right, in terms of um, uh, promoting different ways of approaching medicine uh, which aren't based on evidence. And I felt that we as scientists were, we didn't really enter that landscape very early and I think we fell behind. So that's why we got involved, uh, to try and change that, and ultimately to try and give science a voice uh, within cardi cardiovascular, uh, sci cardiology science at least, on social media. And I think it's gone well. Uh, we now have, we set up the circulation uh, social media feed in 2013 when I moved out here. That was the first cardiology journal to have a social media presence. Now all the cardiology journals do. And, uh, and we actually did a clinical trial, which I want to share with you. Um, so we did a clinical trial using social media. 
I don't know if you've come across this, so we randomized, we took every paper in circulation for two years and we randomized it. And we randomized it to social media posting or to no social media posting and to see the effect of, um, of the impact of these papers. And we found the, the results still blow me away. We found that the social media posting had no impact on the number of people reading papers. That the number, because people don't read papers. <laughs> um, that we would put it out and there would be, you know, 300 people would read papers. But what it did have a huge impact on was the number of people talking about papers. And the difference was just uh, log logarithmic differently. So 300 people would read a paper and there would be over a million impressions about a paper. And it just, and this was, you know, people, we were going to, if you clicked on the abstract, that's what we defined as reading the paper. Um, and uh, so, uh, so all these people were discussing the papers without actually reading it, and, uh, which is fascinating, but at the same time it did broaden the reach of the papers, and, uh, and then broaden the reach of the science. And you could see people were having like really de deep discussion about the paper, and I was like, holy moly, only 300 people have read it, you know? <laughs> but it's just all these opinions. But again, it kind of spoke to the fact that having it out there will increase the the view, how many people see signs, kind of to Libby's point. When we were starting off, we were a very small journal, or at least very small Twitter presence with our, with our journal when we started, and we ended up uh, reaching uh, seven million um, with our papers. Awesome, Molly, let's move to you. So, uh, my initial engagement with Twitter was really just out of curiosity. I'm an informaticist and I cannot resist uh, a new piece of software or social media. You, you know, you have to try it out. Um, but I had a, two very compelling experiences early on that kept me engaged. One was the experience Libby mentioned. Um, I had an exchange with Francis Collins um, at the time of the sequester uh, in relation to some delays we'd been experiencing on receiving the notice of award for a T32 training grant. And after that exchange uh, um, with him, we received our notice of award the next day. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> compelling. And then, <laughs> and then I had an, um, an incidental experience. So I'm, I'm at a county library with a preschool aged child and we're checking out books. And the book that my daughter pulls off the shelf is Barbie, I want to be a computer scientist. And I flip open the book, thrilled that there's a Barbie book about computer science, and it's appalling, sexist, right. horrible. I was, my jaw was on the floor, I couldn't resist, pull out the phone, I snapped a photo of one very terrible page, and I tagged STEM women, which is a big group um, on Twitter, you know, women in science, technology, engineering, math, and they retweeted it. There, were, uh, there was some modest activity around it, and I, I rapidly forgot about it, really, until a month later when a colleague of mine posted on social media a revamped version of that book. Same images, digital, with a completely different script written by a computer science student at Georgia Tech. I, I was uh, taken back and uh, traced it, and apparently when I tagged STEM women and it was retweeted, I didn't see that um, how it was growing because bloggers picked up on it, and what they do is they want to create their own original content around it. So they got a hold of copies of this book, wrote their own original content, and then that then exploded from there and led to led to this this snapshot from a library book going viral. So those were compelling. But uh, later on, I, I became more concerned with promoting science and the work of scientists. And I heard John speak at a meeting here on campus down at the Marriott Library at one point. So when I became interested in using it to promote science for journals, for our faculty here at the College of Nursing, I, I actually went to talk with John and he coached me on some of the some of the processes that they use, and I've developed some of my own that allow me to, to promote the work of the College of Nursing faculty um, with the time that I have to engage on Twitter, and I think it's been very powerful, and there's a lot more that we could be doing with it, and um, look forward to doing that together with the faculty here. Thanks. Go for it, Kristen. 
Um, hi. Um, I'm Kristen Kwan. I'm in the Department of Human Genetics. And um, I started my Twitter account for probably a slightly different reason than many of you did. Um, I started mostly out of curiosity about seven or eight years ago. And um, outside of science, I'm a really huge football fan. And so um, my Twitter handle is actually, it's up there. It's block in the back. And um, it's a nod to a college football blog that I used to write about 20 years ago. <laughs> so, so I realized, and, and I think one aspect of Twitter that maybe we can discuss a little more that's really fantastic is that it's, it's really quite real-time nature, right? And so it's really great for following things like sporting events, because if you're following something, you can tweet something about something that's just happened, and there are a whole community of people who might be watching the same event. And so I got onto this mostly, initially at least, um, and my involvement with Twitter has evolved over over the years, but um, initially it was really to follow football and to follow college football because I was trying to figure out what was happening in a number of different areas. And um, from that, I was able to really, um, I found a bunch of, I found a community of football fans who are like me and we actually have met in real life and they're my friends in real life. Um, and I think one thing that I like to say is that, like Libby was saying, it really kind of evens the playing field. And so I've been in contact with people from sports media and coaches and players um, and so it's been really fun. But over the years, um, of course, I started to realize that uh, Twitter might be a great place for me to discuss my science as well and <laughs> what I do most of the time. And so um, over the years, my involvement and what's actually in my feed has, has changed. And so um, even though I still have a community of football people that I interact with quite a bit, um, I've really started to tweet a lot more science. I've, I've, I like the idea of promoting the visibility of what we're doing, um, of the lab, um, also promoting the work that's in the broader communities, uh, both at Utah and also I work on zebrafish, so in the zebrafish community, um, cell biology community, also vision research, as Brian will talk about as well. And um, it's been a great way to meet lots and lots of people in the community that I've heard of, um, haven't quite met in person, and then when I meet them in person, it's great. I've connected with collaborators uh, this way and um, people who've just become my friends and people I would discuss science with. So um, I would say the, the vast majority of my feed now is, is science, but um, during football season, I will still do some football. So. <laughs> My name is Brian Jones. I'm from the ophthalmology department, Moran Eye Center, uh, here at the University of Utah. Um, I started using Twitter early. Uh, a friend of mine, Chris, suggested I get on it. We were talking on his blog back and forth. Um, and, and I went and looked at Twitter and said, um, and, and, and I replied to the comment that said, you know, basically 140 characters, I don't think it's necessary. Um, and we went back and forth. Uh, Chris said, this, the service is going to change the world, and he was right. Um, so I lurked for a long time, and the way I used Twitter was uh, I found people that I thought were interesting, and then I looked to see who they followed. And uh, so if interesting people are following other people, then they must be really interesting. Um, and then um, fast forward a bit. Uh, we were talking the other day, I have a friend, Jackson Dahl, who's, uh, who's a VC uh, investing in eSports teams. Mm -hmm. This is actually a real thing. I had like no idea. Um, uh, but, and, and I never would have met him in any other environment other than um, Twitter. Uh, and he said something really interesting. He said, you know, other social media platforms are, are who you know, but Twitter is who you want to know because you're interested in something. And uh, I've been kind of pushing that around in my head for a couple of days, and, and, and I think he's right. I think that's like one of the best sort of descriptives that I've heard about Twitter. I'm stealing that. Totally, yeah, you have, you have to credit Jackson. <laughs> I will. Yeah. Um, but uh, so it's, um, it's, it's been this amazing tool. Uh, I get almost all my news there. Um, I view it as sort of a radio that you get to tune your own signal and noise ratio. Um, after the last election, the noise went up a lot. <laughs> um, I've been guilty of some of that. Um, but uh, but you, you still have power and control over getting to sort of tune um, the signal that you want to hear from certain sources, whether it be cardiology or vision science or, or zebrafish. And actually, the science community on Twitter 
is a phenomenal resource. Um, we've, you know, we have a new colleague, uh, uh, Franz Benberg, uh, at the Moran Eye Center, and he showed up and he was looking for a postdoc. And, um, and I said, uh, oh, well, let's ask Twitter. And, and he says, ah, I don't know. And uh, we literally tweeted out and in less than 24 hours, um, his postdoc is actually here. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, less than 24 hours later, they were talking and, and Franz had a postdoc in 24 hours, right? And I mean, I know people that have taken months and even years to find good fits with postdocs. So, so it's, been, um, it's been an amazing resource uh, for, for, for that. Um, there's, there's all sorts of sub-communities. There's a science art community that's, that's actually amazing. Um, anything that you happen to be interested in, there's, there, there's something out there. And, and, and I think the trick is, it's, again, it's not a popularity contest. It's, it's finding somebody that's talking about something you're interested in and engaging them. And, and when you do that, really, really cool stuff happens. Um, that's, that's about all I've got to say with it. Um, okay, I have, I have one more question, and then I want all of you to kind of get poised to ask your own questions, because really this event is for you. Um, before I get there, I forgot to, to point out what's on the slide here. You guys have a job, you audience. You need to, if you're on Twitter, you need to follow these panelists. They're great people to um, get ideas from and to model after. And one reason, <laughs> they're, they're smiling shyly. Um, one reason I chose, we chose this panel is because they all approach Twitter a little differently. And, and I think one thing I want you to walk away with is that there's no magic formula. There are different ways to use pr Twitter, different amounts of time you can put into Twitter, and you can still get something out of it. So you be you. Um, uh, also, we, this is being live, live streamed right now, so if you're on Twitter, um, tweet out those links, say, hey, those of you who can't make it here, you can watch it now, watch it now. And then, um, we, this is being broadcast remotely. We may have some of our affiliate hospitals from around Utah and in adjoining states joining us, which would be amazing. If they are here, um, you ha there's a way that you can ask questions as well. Go to this, it's super easy. Go to this website, www.sli.do.com, enter this four digit code, 7049, and just type in your question, and we'll, we'll look for those questions. Um, and we'd love to know from where you're from if, if you do that. Um, so I have one question. We've been talking a lot about science. Um, I do want to make sure we get something in for our healthcare providers. Um, John Ryan, I'm wondering if there's something you can, uh, you'd like to say, some special con ways that you use um, Twitter um, in your role as a clinician or, or, and or you know, certain things that you are careful to do or not do um, given that role. Sure. Uh, so I think on social media, I think the same rules apply in terms of when you're out socializing in terms of advice that you give people. Namely that if someone comes up to you at a party and they say, listen, you know, I've been having chest pain for the last while, uh, goes into my jaw, goes down my arm, uh, you're going to, you know, tell them, you know, you should really see a doctor. Um, and, and I kind of use that approach as well um, uh, as much as I can. But then there was actually, uh, you know, over, over the time then, you know, you want to give information because the whole role of this, right, is to give information, get, you know, share information, get people to be a little smarter. Um, so there I was hanging out on Twitter one day and, uh, and I got a message from Soledad O'Brien. Um, uh, and she uh, sent me a message. Who is that message. for? So for that O'Brien is a journalist, used to work with CNN, now has uh, her own network uh, that she set up. She's an amazing woman. She's half Irish, uh, half African American, and oh God, she's just amazing. And uh, so anyway, she sends me a message and she says, um, uh, my leg is sore. Do you think it's a DVT or a pulled muscle? <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, I was hanging out with my wife and I was like, Jesus, so that Ryan just uh, wants me to give medical advice over Twitter. And, uh, and, and I was caught between, you know, this is, you know, my worst nightmare and also a dream come true. Um, so what do I do? 
So, so, you know, it kind of evolved over time, so I said, you know, well, listen, the DVT is diagnosed by this. There's typical swelling with the DVT. There might be a risk factor such as, you know, some flight, and, uh, and you can, if you're looking for a DVT, you can get an ultrasound or you can get a blood test, and we kind of had this interaction, and it was all very, uh, all very positive, and as far as I can tell, uh, she didn't have a DVT. Um, <laughs> but, but I think there is an approach you can take rather than just saying, um, rather than either ignoring or distancing, you've put yourself on there, I think engaging um, without actually, you know, truly giving a diagnosis, just the same way that you would do in a, in, a, in a social event, or if a family member were to text you a photo, we get this as well, right, someone sends you a photo of, their, of a child's bum, and they say, what do you think is going on here, and you're like, oh, <laughs> I need to delete that photo. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I think you kind of approach it the same way. The other kind of, uh, I don't uh, tweet while in clinic. Uh, that may sound intuitive, uh, but you know, sometimes you're in clinic and you're twiddling your thumbs and it's a little downtime and you see, you know, some sports events and you decide to say, oh, you know, great, this is great news, Tipperary have just won. And, uh, and then, because your patients are outside and if you are half an hour behind through no fault of your own, now you're half an hour behind because you're sending out tweets. Um, so I don't uh, tweet while in clinic. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, so we can leave it at that for now. Awesome. Hey, we did get a few questions remotely through Slido, so use it if you haven't. Um, and so I want to reward that person and ask this question to the panelists. Um, what are some of the favorite accounts that you follow and why? Anyone? <laughs> Somebody? <laughs> uh, I follow Libby. Yeah, I follow Libby. <laughs> I follow Brian. <laughs> I follow Brian too. Uh, yeah, I follow everybody. Yeah. Uh, okay, there's a lot of inside. Yeah. Jen Gunter, Dr. Jen oh. Gunter, in, in case you want some really good, kind of snarky um, medical advice. Um, University of Utah Health, U of U Health, you all should be following that. Um, U Utah also. U Utah, yes. Um, I think the University of Utah Health, I'm not just saying this because you're here, Libby, but I think it really gives you an idea as to what's going on locally. Because the emphasis oftentimes can be, oh, you can find out what's going on internationally, you can find out what's going on news. But we're such a big campus that sometimes you don't realize what's going on locally and what the great things people yeah. are doing. So I do think that the University of Utah Health, actually, I think you guys have done a good job tapping into that. Well, we also, if, if anyone's interested, you can just tweet at me or you can email me. We actually have a list of every provider yeah. and every person who works for U of U Health and uh, a good swath of U Utah. Um, we have a list of everybody's Twitter accounts, so you can follow everybody. Uh, and that's, that's actually one way that I use it is that, you know, because sometimes I don't know everything that's going on at, at the university. You know, people won't send me, we're going to have this surgery or I have this paper coming out. But they will put yeah. it out on Twitter. Yeah. So then I can grab that and I can, and we can turn it into a press release or we can turn it into something bigger. We also do have a couple doctors that kind of use Twitter as, as a public relations um, feed. They'll, they'll put stuff out and they'll tag members of the media when they feel like there's a story that's, that's necessary um, or that they want covered. And then you know our, our office will get phone calls saying, I, I saw this on Twitter and yeah, I, I want to do a story on it. I think it's also important to realize that, that Twitter is completely transparent in, in a lot of ways, unless there's a private account. So you can you can actually go to anybody's account and see who they follow, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, you click on the person, you click on you know who they follow, and, and you can get a really deep dive in, into what their interests are. Um, uh, and also, you know, so you can tweet, you can retweet. You can a favorite, and all of that is transparent too. So, um, uh, and this can be a double-sided blade, right? Um, but, but I, I actually find it tremendously informative. If you're interested in following somebody new, go see what they liked, go see what they favorited, right? That is far more informative necessarily than who they're retweeting or who they're. Following. Yeah, I would also say, however, be careful what you like, mm -hmm. uh, because people will, will do that, right? Or at yeah. least, yeah. yeah. Then but, the but, but, but if you're being, you know, yeah. Yeah. honest and 
about it, then, then yeah, it's, it's an incredibly informative tool. Yeah. Um, People who have time. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I scroll very lightly, to be honest. I'm more of a hunter-gatherer. I like hashtags. I, I go and find information on topics that I, I want to see what's out on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I think you brought up something that a friend of yours said on Twitter the other day, or this person, the, that VC person? Oh, yeah, Did you, you, yeah, so yeah. you retweeted that, right? I, I think I went so. into yeah, that yeah, conversation, yeah. Yeah. and I think the statement right before that I think really resonated with me because I think it was something along, along the lines of Twitter is a forum where you can figure out pretty quickly the groups of people you want to be interacting with. Right. Mm. And I thought that was really that was really true. You can go and do these kinds of dives and figure out where you want to be and who you want to be interacting with and what you want to see. Right. And, and that's, you know, it's, Twitter's a tool. It's, it's a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, powerful tools can be used for good and bad, right? So, so with, with that caveat. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, yeah, it's, uh, so, so in answer to the, to, to answer the, the person's question, um, I, I would, I would, Literally, just go and see who people follow, and and then you can get. If you're interested, you can do a really deep dive into which accounts we follow. I'd love to open the questions to the audience. Who has a question? Um, Susan, there's someone behind you. Oh, and follow Ben Winslow. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, if, if you want to know what's going on in Utah, follow Ben Winslow. Especially during the legislative yes. session. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. 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 Please use the microphone. Hi, uh, I work with the TVC here on campus, and I'm just wondering if the U of U Health has some sort of uh, guidelines as far as what, when you should put something out on Twitter and when you should not put something out on Twitter. We, uh, I'll take this one. We do not have anything official like letter and, and number. Um, I, I believe John said, if we can get you in trouble in, in real life, we can get you in trouble on social media. One thing that I always say is, oh, go ahead. I'm more of like, with your publications and all of that, you can lose your patent rights if you put something out and it's, that's considered public domain. And so that's why I'm kind of just wondering if you had anything of that level of it. No, we, we kind of... Um, kind of depend on, on our people to kind of know what they should and shouldn't put out. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember what, there was another one, there was another issue like this that, that you couldn't, they couldn't put out certain research papers because of how they were published or where they were published. But really we're, we're counting on, on people who, that's, that's your expertise. So just as I would, I would, I would count on a doctor not to put out something that would violate HIPAA, I would, I would count on you to know, you know the bounds of your yeah. professional guidelines. There's so many unique circumstances, I think it's hard for us to make guidelines for them all. Yeah. Um, there's a, Susan, I'm gonna, no. okay. No, if, if, someone, if there's someone close to you, go for it. What about the risks and, do I have to drink? Can you hear me? Oh, uh, what about the risks involved? I mean, so, you know, obviously you think something's completely appropriate. Public perception could be a completely different thing. Um, has, have any of you experienced where there's been a critic, there's been something that's blown up in the wrong way, and if we are now, you know, putting out something as an external facing, you know, profile of the university, how as we, as individuals behind those accounts, ensure that, you know, it's presented in the best light? Yeah, Libby, can I? So, so thank you for that question. So the, the question is, kind of, you send something out and it kind of backfires, right? Or something along those lines. So, um, so, I had a, uh, so one time I was hanging out on Twitter and, uh, and there was this discussion among medical students about um, uh, what things do you regret not um, doing while you were in medical school? And kind of what rotations did you kind of not engage in as much, and, uh, and what would you do to differently if, if you were in medical school again. And I've actually always thought, and I've told this to, to people in general, that I um, didn't work very hard on my psychiatry rotation. It was a six-week rotation. 
And uh, as we say in Ireland, it was a DOS. You turn up at 10, you leave at 12, and it, was very, you know, it wasn't uh, a very intense rotation. And I've actually always regretted it because I never got that opportunity again. And, um, and uh, so I, you know, engaged in this conversation. I said, you know, I, 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 I regret not doing my psychiatry rotation as taking it seriously as I should because I would use it every day, right? Which I thought was a fairly innocuous statement. Um, I then ended up getting contacted by, um, by someone, by a patient, who said, um, I saw, you know, the following day, got a message saying, I saw what you said about your patients on Twitter. I am not seeing you anymore because you think we're all crazy. Oh. And uh, I was like, that was not my intention at all. If anything, you know, that, that was nowhere near my intention. And, um, but to the patient, it was. You know, so there's no, you know, their perception was, was reality. And uh, so really I had to kind of reflect. So now, since then, I kind of reflect. And every time I send something out, I think, can this be taken the wrong way? And, uh, and that, one really, that one really surprised me. Um, I think there's a question over here, Susan. Um, and while she's walking over there, I mean, do, you, do any of you have other stories about, I mean, you learn from your mistakes, right? Do you have any other stories where you regretted something you did or maybe something that you see others do that you well, wish they wouldn't? <laughs> I, I, think, I think it is important to note that, um, so uh, my PhD mentor, Robert Mark, has this policy that never says anything that can't be repeated in public. And, and that's a good policy for Twitter. He's also on Twitter. Um, but, you know, and, and while we're representatives of the University of Utah, we're not spokespeople for the University mm -hmm. of Utah, but we still, in a sense, represent the community. We're part of the community. And um, the things that you say can have impact. So, uh, my chairman and I were in Australia recently talking with a potential donor. And potential donor, we're at dinner at this donor's house, and uh, the donor leans over to me and he says, um, tell me, Brian, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a conservative, I'm an old conservative guy, um, what do you think of Mr. Trump? <laughs> and uh, 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 I, I said, uh, you know, uh, Mr. So-and-so, uh, my wife and I have a policy, uh, nobody discusses Mr. Trump at dinner. <laughs> and everybody at the table, you know, <laughs> very well played, very well played. And, and, I, and I thought I was off the hook. And he leans over and he says, no, really, tell me, what is your opinion of Mr. Trump? And, and I look across the table at my chairman, and it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> nothing, you know, and, and I'm, I'm begging somebody to, you know, spill a glass of wine, <laughs> cough uncontrollably. Um, and and, and so, so I had to respond. And, and, and of course I was going to be honest, but if I wasn't honest, and he did his due diligence, mm -hmm. um, I have said what I've said on, on, on Twitter. And so there are potential risks and downsides. Uh, and, uh, but, but I think if you just, if you, if you have the policy that, you know, um, if you stand behind what you say uh, and you justify it, Okay, let's go to the question up there. Thanks very much. Um, so I, I work with John in cardiology. My question is, um, in our field, electrophysiology is very technical, and I found Twitter, Twitter very helpful because people will trade cases, uh, images, highly technical images that uh, you wouldn't be able to recognize the patient at all, except that if you were the patient that day, uh, you might say, oh, so-and-so did two cases that day. Uh, I might, you know, that might be my image. Um, I have another partner that, you know, had the patient sign a release just to show an x-ray on Twitter, even though there's no way I would know who that patient is. The question is, um, from university policy and from experience, you know, obviously HIP is HIP, and it's easy not to release HIPAA information, but there, you know, at least in our field, is probably a rather gray area in terms of how one could figure out that their image was on Twitter, whether it temporally related or that sort of thing. Does university, I mean, our consent forms have some sort of language about image and video being captured as part of the procedure, but the question is, you know, does university have a policy, and, and what's you guys' thoughts on that? So I don't, I don't ask for advice on Twitter because I, I feel like it's, if the patient really wanted to, they could potentially figure out that, that I was talking about them. 
I always say that if you think you need a release form, you probably need a release form. Uh, you'd be surprised at, at the things that people have been, ident been, been able to identify. Um, that said, when it comes to cases, I would never, if, if you, if it really is non-identifiable of a patient, I just wouldn't send it out on the same day. Yeah. Um, just, you know, just as I always say, uh, like for instance, I would never ask anyone to tweet during surgery. Because um, their phone would get dirty. <laughs> but, uh, you know, s save stuff for later, so that it, it's 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 distance as, as far as possible. But there's but no there's particular also, university. Yeah. There's also metadata associated with imagery. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That, of course. So is, can I, you, uh, Brian? Can you pick up the mic? Sorry. Th there's also metadata associated with imagery, right? Whether it's clinical imagery, whether it's cell phone imagery, um, that can be extracted. So anytime you Post data. Yeah. I, I, I think you have to be sensitive to, you know, issues related to potential data that are carried along with the actual pixels um, that can tell you information. I mean, sometimes, you know, patient identifiable data is in the metadata, um, and so uh, I just I think that's an issue that you have to be careful about. But that's that's a HIPAA issue regardless. So, yeah. and I've seen it as well, Ben. Um, I don't. Uh, talk about clinical, clinic, uh, or procedures on Twitter. Um, I think, I, I agree with you, I see what people do and it blows me away. Um, because I think on the, on, the, on the other end, you're, as a patient, I think it would just be really upsetting if, you, if this was going out and, and they didn't know. Uh, so I do actually think that it does require, I, I think it needs a consent to be honest with you. Um, I do want to make sure to get some how-tos in there. I mean, if you say you're, you're in this situation, your research paper has come out, you want to publicize, um, you know, what you've just accomplished, what, what are some steps that you take? Anyone? Sure. So you should have some sort of marketing and communications person in your department or your area. And it's, uh, if, if you have some new findings that are worthy of a press release, uh, you know, it's very important to work with your marketing yes. person to prepare <laughs> a press release. Uh, Let us know when, when it's accepted for publication. Super important. And then, okay. then you have content to push out. And if you're, if you're like most faculty, I know you have about this much time to deal with Twitter, right? So make it count. Um, do, engage with Twitter, push out content like that, and then publicize it. Uh, spend your time in that way. Also, use the tools that are available to you to monitor who's talking about your research. Most people who talk about your article are not going to tag you. So no one's going to come to your door and knock on it and say, hey, we're talking about your article. So you're, it's important that you take a peek at alt metrics now and then. Uh, Scopus, available to you through the Eccles Library, is your friend. You can set up. Um, you can set up searches that let you know as soon as your articles are coming out and there's material out on the web. And also Plum, Plum Analytics has widgets in Scopus now so you can look at your articles and you can see who's talking about them on social media. And then you can retweet and tag your media and communications person uh, so they can retweet. Uh, so. Uh, it, taking an active role in sort of uh, monitoring and curating the social media around the research that you publish, I think, is key. I would, uh, I would add then as well, actually. So, so a follow-up study that um, was done then on the, the journals was another uh, trial where the papers were, um, and this was from the Annals of Surgery, and the papers were randomized. So, so our study, which, by the way, was called Intention to Tweet, Thank you. Um, uh, so the, the follow-up study was done by the Annals of Surgery, and what they did was they took all the papers, put them on social media, and they randomized them to having a picture from the, uh, from the paper versus not having the picture. That was the only difference. Picture, no picture. Um, and probably unsurprisingly, the tweets that had pictures associated with it had a 20-fold uh, increased number of views and sharing and so on, because people like pictures. Um, as it turns out, most of the journals uh, now have, 
you know, historically, and this is a copyright issue as well, as you know, you, you write your paper, you do figures one to seven, and then you're kind of giving away figures one to seven to the journal, and, and, and they own the figures and so on. Most of the journals now have become comfortable because of the Annals of Surgery uh, paper and others, have become comfortable with you, you know, screen capturing the figures, screen capturing the text, just something that gets people Onto, uh, onto their website or at least discussing their papers. So as you're promoting your papers or promoting your faculty's papers, I would try and get a key figure and, uh, and include that because the reach is much, much farther with figures. Yeah, something clever I've seen uh, some people do is to digest their paper into yeah. six or eight tweets, which oh, yeah. can be sad if you've just spent five years on this and now it's represented in 400 characters. Um, but that's, that's, I think, really cool. And then um, also, you know, tag your collaborators, tag the journal, tag your funding agencies, tag um, Libby, um, anyone, yeah, institutions, anyone you think might retweet it, and, and you'd be surprised how far it can go. Um, Susan, there's a question over there. There's one, there's one oh. Here. Uh, wherever you want to go, <laughs> you choose. Um, and, and, oh yeah, Jean has been waiting, yep. Um, so you mentioned this great scientific community on Twitter, and I'm wondering when bad science goes out and becomes viral and gets circulated, what, how do you feel about that? And kind of in this great scientific community, is there anything that you feel like compelled to do or that you should do? Do you feel responsible for kind of stopping, stopping those bad science articles to, to get into the wider public? What are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, so uh, a little while ago, for instance, there was uh, an article. Um, Can you change into the mic? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> a while ago, there was uh, uh, an article by a friend of mine, Amy Harmon, in the New York Times on um, basically mind uploading. Uh, so so the, the gist of the article was uh, there was a young woman, and um, she got a recent diagnosis of cancer and she was going to die. And she had met her, uh, the love of her life, and they weren't ready to be apart. Uh, so she signed up for the service that would freeze her brain uh, with the promise that she would be, uh, or the prospect that she might be reunited with her family uh, later when the technology emerged to upload brains. Uh, and this was a New York Times article. And um, Amy went out and interviewed lots of people in the neuroscience community, uh, some big names um, that uh, were quoted in this article. And uh, I flipped. Um, it, was, it, was, it was outrageous. Um, it was, I mean, the, the, the neuroscience, anybody who does connectomics research at the synaptic level, you know, with a little math, you know, they could, they, they understand what the issues were. And so uh, the neuroscience Twitter community sort of erupted a little bit. There was actually some really great dialogue back and forth. And, and a lot of people pushed back pretty hard. And, and Amy was a little surprised because she didn't know what the issues were because she, she interviewed, you know, people that she thought were, you know, um, good sources. Um, so, so there's always going to be issues like this that come up. Uh, and, and the nice thing about Twitter is that there are a lot of people that really do know the subject matter. And, mm -hmm. and they will push back. And, and they will work to, to, to sort of try and correct the record and, and, and inform. Um, and, you know, there, there's, there's going to be some noise. There's going to be some jostling, some sharp elbows. Um, but, uh, Hopefully, you know, uh, the good message gets out. Um, is there more questions from the audience? Um, Susan, maybe you can make it. Um, Libby, there's a specific question. What, um, what app do you use to schedule your posts? Um, we, use, we use Hootsuite uh, as, as the <coughs> university. Um, me personally, if you don't want to spend money, I like TweetDeck. That's really, really easy. Um, but, but, but the university uses Hootsuite because it has, it has analytic capacity that, capacities that we use. All right. This is just a simple question. Just the difference between using the dot at versus the at. 
I mean, how does that change how it's disseminated? That's a Libby question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so think of Twitter as a sentence. So if you're doing just the at, it's only going to the person that you're responding to. So it'll only be seen by people that follow both of you. Uh, but if you're doing, if you do a period first, that's the first symbol that Twitter reads. So it reads it as an individual tweet. So it'll be seen by all of your followers, not just by the people that follow both of you. Okay. All of my followers, not all the other, the person no. who I'm yeah. at adding. Yeah. So the, uh, the starting with an at, it's, it's based on an old Twitter algorithm that if you start with an at, they read it as a reply. Mm -hmm. So they think it's a reply just to that person. It's publicly viewable if you go to that person, if you go to your page, we go to Dr. Cipiano's page, they can see it, but it won't be, it won't come up on people's feed. So when you, for example, you know, a paper comes out in, um, and, and you want to tag U of U Health doing a dot, at U of U Health will then turn up on everyone's feed. Whereas if you just did at U of U Health, the only person who would really see it would be U of U Health or if they went to your feed specifically. So it goes, if I do dot at U of U Health, it goes to all of U of U Health? No, no all, of your, all of your followers. All of okay. your followers, right. yeah. Really? I thought the mechanics were different depending on if you actually hit just the reply button. I think if you hit the reply button, everyone sees it now. But if you hit I'll have, reply, to, look, I'll have to look at that because I wasn't Yeah, sure. just, just Google it. Oh. <laughs> it's, yeah, they changed it about two years ago. Yeah. Two years ago. Uh oh. Um, what about time commitment? Um, how much time do you spend on it? Um, and what's a good way to get started on Twitter? Anyone in the panel? I think there's no right answer for how much time to spend on Twitter. Um, I actually probably spend not very much time at all on Twitter. I probably check in in the evening. Um, I, I get notifications, so I might check in in the middle of the day if I get a notification that a bunch of people are seeing something that seems like it might be important. Um, so I think there's no right answer. I think you need to spend the amount of time on Twitter that you feel comfortable with. I know people who are on Twitter pretty much 24 hours a day. I am not comfortable doing that. I don't feel like I have the space in my brain to do that. Um, to get started, I think it's, I mean, I think Brian used the word lurk. And I think it's a really great idea to just get out there and just start watching. You don't have to say anything at first. You can just start watching. It's a very kind of easy, um, sort of, it's an easy way to just start to look and see what you might be interested in, in seeing. And once you start to feel comfortable, that's when you can start conversing. So Libby, I think you do have sort of a minimum recommendation, is that right? I would say that if you really want to have a presence and you want to, you know, be out there, I would say you need to tweet at least three to five times a week. That's kind of how I, I tell people to get started. Um, you can schedule those. Um, I do spend a lot of time on Twitter. Um, and I would honestly say that to set up everything for a week for University of Utah Health, it takes me maybe a half an hour to 45 minutes. So like if I'm, going, if I'm going on vacation and I need to set up tweets for a week ahead, it, it, that's how long it takes me. Um, that said, you can, you can fall down a rabbit hole and you can be on Twitter all day. Uh, but to really get started, I would say three to five times. Also remember that this is social media, so you need to be social. Don't just send out tweets with links. You know, retweet other people's stuff, reply to it. Have conversations, it's, it, it is really important. Um, also, you know, be you. While you're putting out science, also have a personality. You know, that, that's what people like. That's what people want to see. Uh, for instance, tweets from the University of Utah, because it's, it's just a you, mm. are usually seen a lot less than the exact same tweets sent out by a person. Because, you know, people like to interact with people, not yous. Yeah. And then similarly with your profile, um, your photo should be a person. Uh, hopefully you, <laughs> um, and uh, but having either a symbol or or something along those lines, people don't trust that as much, mm -hmm. and um, so won't engage with it. There's also there's some subtle things about timing as well, Libby. Right? I mean, Friday afternoon, Friday night, Saturday. Um, there is, in particular Friday, there's not a whole lot of action going on. Sunday is kind of your Sunday, in particular Sunday night football time is kind of your big, there's a lot of people online then, uh, a lot of blog posts go out then. Monday is kind of slow because people are working. 
uh, Tuesday afternoon starts picking up because people are tired of working. Um, so there, there's kind of a timing thing you got to pay attention. But if you put something out six o'clock on a Friday, it'll get lost. Mm -hmm. Uh, any other? Yeah. The, the master of good enough, right? Sure. Use a microphone, please. Actually, when faculty tell me, you know, how much, you know, how much do I need to be doing on Twitter, I say, don't do too much. I'm very concerned about how our attention is being scattered by social media. And personally, I don't even have these apps on my phone. So I block specific times during the week where I intentionally engage with Twitter. Um, and it, can, it is engagement as well as content generation. And those are the times I have set aside. And then I try to intentionally shut off social media in between, which is probably counterculture on this panel. <laughs> Um, our time is about up. I do want to ask about tweeting at meetings because it seems like that's a really easy way to get started. I don't know what you think. Um, does anyone want to talk about tweeting at, at national meetings, uh, professional meetings? Um, I, I don't. I, I've done it a little bit. I, I think at meetings, one of the things that I've liked doing uh, with Twitter is using it to promote uh, junior scientists, graduate students, and postdocs. Uh, and, and helping get their names out there. It's, it's a really low cost way of, of really helping your students um, and, and trainees uh, get name recognition. Um, I agree with that. I think that the one thing to keep in mind though is that it is a meeting and certain, f certain meetings have very right. specific rules about what you can and can't tweet about what's being um, presented. Right. So in general, I like to tweet meetings. I like to talk about, hey, this person is talking now. Um, but often I will only mention something very general having to do with the title, which is often a public thing as the title of the talk and I won't go into any data and certainly um, no pictures of data at all. Um, and so again, I like the idea of promoting, you know, just the idea of the, the kinds of science that are being discussed, especially, you know, we're trying to promote visibility of the different scientific communities at the university or in like I said, zebrafish or vision science. Um, and so that's a great way to do it. It's really fun. They're often hashtags. And then people get together and talk about how they're all tweeting the meeting. Um, and I think it's a great way to promote visibility in a very public way. But again, like for some conferences, for example, I think Gordon conferences have a very, very strict rule about not tweeting. So. I would just add that uh, it's gotten easier not to go to meetings uh, because of Twitter. Yeah. And, uh, and you can really kind of follow along um, with the data that is coming out and, and, you know, breaking clinical trials and so on. Hey, so we are out of time. There is a lot of questions on Slido that we did not get to. So um, feel free to email Libby <laughs> or tweet at Libby, um, libby.mitchell at hsc.utah.edu. Uh, um, also, if one of if we also didn't cover a lot of basics about you know how to use hashtags, how to use um, at symbols and things like that, so uh, Libby is also your resource for those questions. She's going to stay here, um, and some of our panelists may have time to do that as well. If you have additional questions, please come to the front. And thank you very much for coming. And um, I would love to hear your ideas for other sessions like this that could be useful to you. So um, thanks very much. Thank you.